And for you guys who have been in the grit and the grind of planting and sacrificing, serving and risking and failing and trying and all of that over this last year, for those of you who are greeting and those of you who are working with kids and those of you who are there on Friday night for Parents Night Out and those of you who have opened your homes and for those of you who moved and for those of you who miss your families and for those of you who are raising your kids in a much different environment that you were raised in as well and you've been willing to take that risk. For those of you who have been scared and rather than internalizing that and self-medicating through that and said you told somebody and you put your, your heart out there so that you wouldn't cope in unhealthier ways. Wherever it is, all those seemingly insignificant things, it feels a lot like driving a boat. But it is the sacred substance in which God has cultivated something really beautiful here. Hello, my name is Kevin Stone, and I'm one of the pastors here at Proclamation Church. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Proclamation Online. Here at Proclamation, our values are to engage all people, to grow as the family of God, to go because Christ came for us, and to proclaim Jesus and not ourselves. No matter your age, race, gender, or socioeconomic status, we want to engage you with the life-changing message of the gospel. We believe that the local church is God's plan. And while we're excited to serve you through these online resources, this should never replace your commitment to your local church. If you happen to live in the Nashville, Tennessee area, I want to personally invite you to one of our Sunday morning gatherings at either the 9 a.m. or 10.45 a.m. service. If God is using this church to impact your life, you can partner with us financially by giving online through our website. And if this is your first time checking out Proclamation, we don't want you to feel compelled by us to give. We're just glad that you're here. We hope that this message helps you to fix your eyes on Jesus and helps drive you deeper into the gospel. We are going to be in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 13. Uh, let's read it together. It says, Some time passed. David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar and David's son Amnon was infatuated with her. Amnon was frustrated to the point of making himself sick over his sister Tamar because she was a virgin, but it seemed impossible to do anything to her. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, a son of David's brother, Shemaiah. Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he asked Amnon, why are you the king's son so miserable? Every morning, won't you tell me? Amnon replied, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend you're sick, and when your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare a meal in my presence so I can watch and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be sick. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my presence so I can eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, please go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare a meal for him. Then Tamar went to his house while Amnon was lying down. She took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his presence, and baked them. She brought the pan and set it down in front of him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, everyone leave me. And everyone left him. Bring the meal to the bedroom, Amnon told uh, Tamar, so I can eat from your hand. Tamar took the cake she had made and went to her brother Amnon's bedroom. And when she brought them to him he, uh, to eat, he grabbed her and said, come sleep with me, my sister. Don't. My brother, she cried, don't disgrace me, for such a thing should never be done in Israel. Don't commit this outrage. Where could I ever go with my humiliation? And you, you would be like one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Please speak to the king, for he won't keep me from you. But he refused to listen to her, and because he was stronger than she was, he disgraced her by raping her. So Amnon hated Tamar with such intensity that the hatred he hated her with was greater than the love that he had loved her with. Get out of here he said. No, she cried. Sending me away is much worse than the great wrong you've already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. Instead, he called to the servant who waited on him. Get this, get this woman away from me. Throw her out and bolt the door behind her. Amnon's servant threw her out and bolted the door behind her. Now Tamar was wearing a long-sleeved garment because this is what the king's virgin daughters wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long-sleeved garment she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away crying out. Her brother Absalom said to her, has your brother Amnon been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. <clears throat> Don't take this thing to heart. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. Let's pray. 
Father, we so desperately need you today. Uh, this is uh, hard. Um, this is your word, but it's a hard portion of it as well. Um, Father, I pray that here in this moment that you would uh, allow us to hear what your word has to say, respond in such a way where uh, we would become a church uh, that cares well uh, for the vulnerable, that cares well for the abused. Uh, this has been my prayer all week, and I pray that this could be our posture moving forward as a church. We are called to uh, heal, to restore, um, because that's what you've done for us through Jesus. Father, would you move me out of the way? Uh, would you increase and let me decrease? Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we continue in our series this morning, I need to remind you, if you did not catch it already from what we've read, this will not be an easy subject this morning. Uh, far from it. Uh, and for that reason, um, I'm letting you guys know that I am uh, almost verbatim sticking to my notes. Uh, I will make little to no eye contact uh, because I want to make sure that what I say is uh, clearly articulated uh, in a way that makes sense uh, and in a way that we all can understand. Um, I have referenced and looked at a lot of stats uh, in preparing for this sermon. Um, I've listened to many other sermons in preparing for this sermon. I've reached out uh, for counsel uh, from professional counselors as well as other pastors in preparation for this sermon. And I've prayed for wisdom multiple times in preparation for this sermon. But in all of that preparedness, uh, I feel unprepared <laughs> to share this subject today. This topic is both very difficult uh, and personal. Uh, I've prepared several sermons, and none, I feel, have equaled to the weight of this one that we're going to talk about today. There are many that I know personally. There are many people that I've pastored. And there are many people that I've come in contact with that are victims of abuse. And I've asked that the Holy Spirit would minister to so many of them today, and I truly believe that he will because he is good and he is kind. Abuse is vicious, and we're going to see through this narrative here in the text today why. There are a few things that we see from the reading of the Scriptures today, but I want to highlight a few things about abuse here. And the very first thing is this. Abuse always distorts love. Abuse always distorts love. It says that David's son Amnon was infatuated with his sister Tamar. It said that he was so frustrated that he could not, it was making himself sick, right? He, he had this passion for her, but it seemed impossible, it said, for him to do anything about it. He, he said that I'm in love with her. And what we see is that Amnon had a distorted view of love. He was infatuated, right? He was infatuated, but he understood this infatuation as, as love. And when you look at the word love used here in this story, it's actually talking about attraction, or if we get down into the, uh, uh, the nitty-gritty of it, it's lust. It's not love as we need to grow in an understanding of as followers of Jesus. It was lust. What we need to understand about love is that true love is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. What this love is that we see is self-serving. It was so intense, it said, that it made him sick. And we realize that he indeed did not love her because of how he responds to her after he acted, which is what we see in verse 15. It says that he actually hated her with such intensity that the hatred that he had for her was more so than the so-called love that he had for her at the very beginning. We're going to talk about this later on, but Amnon, right, instead of owning what he did, what was wrong, he got angry at her, right? And he hates her for what he did. This is not love. This is not love, and I need you guys to hear me say this, that if you are single, if you are in a relationship where you're being taken advantage of, where you have expressed a dislike for what your partner is doing or has done or is doing to you, that is not love. And you need to find a way to step away from that relationship. He or she does not love you. They are content with what they are getting from you. That's self-serving. That is not love at all. What we see is abuse not only distorts love, but it also thrives when it goes unchecked. Verse 3, it says, Amnon had a friend. It was his cousin, Jonadab. It was, we know it's the son of David's brother, Shemaiah, right? 
So Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he asked Amnon, why are you the king's son so miserable every morning? Won't you tell me? So Amnon said, I'm in love with Tamar, and I, I can't do anything about it, right? So Jonadab said to him, lie down in your bed, pretend you're sick, and he lays out this plan for her, right? Now, Amnon and, and Jonadab, as we see, they were cousins here. Now, again, let me be clear. Jonadab never suggests rape here, but he does plant the seeds in Amnon's mind. He communicates deception and lying so that Amnon could manipulate Tamar. Essentially, what we see here is Jonadab, at the moment, could have called Amnon out, right? Bro, this ain't love. In fact, what you're dealing with, this is infatuation at best, and at, at worst, it's lust at its core, and this is wrong. Now, we do need to understand context, right? Uh, uh, Amnon was a prince, right? He was, he was David's son. We, we realize, if you look at the text, that he was actually supposed to be the next king. He was the firstborn son. And so we can understand that Jonadab had to have a level of respect for, for Amnon, that he couldn't just call him out, right? But here's what I want us to realize, is even if Jonadab could not be uh, abruptly honest with Amnon, men realize the brokenness of sexual sin in their peers, and oftentimes, instead of calling them out, they oftentimes remain silent and allow impurity to fester out of fear of what may be said to them or done to them. And this is what we see happening here. Can we be frank here? Not only do men actually realize the brokenness of sexual sin in their peers and they remain silent, they oftentimes see it in themselves as well and are silent all the more. We could have an entire sermon series on this, but I need you to hear me say this, men, and women, you need to hear me say this as well, because this isn't a one-gender problem. We also allow abuse to go unchecked when we willingly allow and utilize pornography in our lives. Pornography is helping to contribute to sexual abuse that's taking place in our world. And you may not be a Jonadab and not standing up to Amnon, but you are a Jonadab when you aren't saying anything to and for yourself. Every click, every look, every search, that's allowing abuse to go unchecked. Essentially what you're communicating after every search Every click, every look is this. You are here for my personal use. And once I get what I want, I can discard you as an afterthought. And you can say that porn isn't hurting anyone, but you are looking at the Imago Dei, the image of God in these individuals are saying they aren't worth it. They're not worth it at all. Every click, every look, every search is feeding into abuse. We'll see this later on as well, but we need more men standing up and speaking out for the vulnerable. We need people in general standing up and speaking out for the vulnerable. If we don't, we are allowing abuse to go unchecked, which also shows this. Not only does abuse distort love and thrives when it goes unchecked, it also lacks reason. Listen, when the plan was hatched and when he got her alone, the second part of verse 11 says this, he grabbed her and said, come sleep with me, my sister. Now, to which she replied with these things here. Verse 12, don't, my brother, she cried, don't humiliate me, for such a thing should never be done in Israel. Don't do this horrible thing. Where could I ever go with my disgrace? And you, you would be like one of the immoral men in Israel. Please speak to the king, for he won't keep me from you. Now, that version that I just read was the ESV, and I'm going to tell you why I read that in just a second. But I want us to understand and look at how she responds here. The first thing that she says is, don't do this. In other translations, like the ESV and the New King James Version um, and the Holcomb uh, Christian Standard Version, what we see simply is the word no. No. This is common sense, but it has to be stated here. No means I'm not giving you permission to do this. No means keep your hands to yourself. No means I'm not interested in what you're trying to offer me. No means no. One of the best things that we can talk about and teach in our culture is what we in my family call first-time obedience. When we talk to True and Michael, we don't give them chances. We don't give them uh, tries over and over again. And I know that's a piece some people like, well, that's not gracious. Man, I'm trying to show them what first-time obedience looks like. Because delayed obedience is still disobedience. We have to create in our, our children, in our culture, what no means. And especially when it comes to this area. 
Tamar says no. In fact, Tamar included a form of the word no in the first four consecutive clauses of her response to, to Amnon. She directly ordered him, no, don't rape me, she says. Then she appealed, listen to how she appealed to him. She appealed to his conscience, reminding him what he was pursuing there in that moment was a, quote, wicked thing that, quote, should not be done in Israel, which was pointing back to the Old Testament law. She was reminding him of scripture there. Then she compels Amnon to think about the lasting effect of the actions on, on, on her life personally. Amnon's theft of her virginity would place her on a, pers uh, on a personal level of disgrace, as she says. As we read it in verse 13, it says humiliation, but in the ESV it says disgrace. Where can I take this disgrace? She would never get rid of it, she said. And then she tries to reason for his life, <clears throat> which if you look down and get to the bare roots of it, was a grace to him, right? She's extending grace to him by saying here in this moment that if you were to do this, this is going to ruin your reputation, causing him to be thought of as, quote, one of the immoral men in Israel. List after list. And then her last ditch effort was to appeal to their dad, right? She says, let's, let's actually go talk to the king. Maybe the king will give, you, give me to you in marriage, right? Now, I don't know if David would allow the intermarriage to happen because at this point it was uh, against Levitical law, it was against the law of Israel to do that. But what I do know is this, you can hear the desperation in her voice. Do you hear it? She gave instance after instance after instance on why he should not do this thing. She told him no, flat out. She tried to reason with him scripturally. She tried to reason with his empathy. She tried to reason with reputation and character, and he disregarded them all. Why? Because his lust drove him to lack any reason whatsoever. And the result is he took advantage of her, which leads us to this about abuse. It overpowers the vulnerable. It overpowers the vulnerable, verse 14. But he refused to listen to her, and because he was what? Stronger than she was. He raped her. There's nothing more to say here than this. Every time abuse, every time rape happens, it is always the powerful taking advantage of the one with no power. And it always happens because the powerful knows that they can do it. In that moment, they know that there's absolutely nothing that the vulnerable can do, and so they move forward in their wickedness, which always, lastly, leaves the vulnerable feeling unwanted. Look what he says to her at the end of verse 15. Get out of here, he said. Verse 16, no, she cried. Sending me away is much worse than what you've just done to me. But he refused to listen to her. Instead, he called to the servant who waited on him, throw this woman out and bolt the door behind her. Amnon's servant threw her out and bolted the door behind her. Now Tamar was wearing a long sleeve garment because this is what the king's virgin daughters wore. Tamar put ashes on her head, tore the long sleeve garment she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away crying out. Once again, Tamar attempts to persuade her brother to see reason, right? And then what's so frustrating here is he compounded his evil deeds in rejecting her after all of this pretended love that he had towards her. His response communicates that he never cared, never, quote, loved her at all, as he was trying to portray. Amnon, who was to be king after David, flexed his power and took advantage of Tamar, his half-sister. And now, even though she's a princess, she is thrown out of Amnon's presence. Did you catch what he called her? Get this woman out of here. Couldn't even acknowledge her as an individual. He couldn't acknowledge her dignity. She was only an object to him now. And him yelling to bolt the door after her was his attempt to rid himself even of the memory of her. Now, as much as he wanted her, her response is, is one that communicates that she will no longer be wanted. She ripped her garments that symbolized her purity to communicate that she was no longer pure. She put ashes on her head, which was tradition to communicate grief and mourning and sadness. She put her hand on her head trying to cover herself because now she was exposed. Family, what we see from this text is sexual abuse will always distort love. It thrives when it goes unchecked. It lacks reason. It overpowers the vulnerable and then leaves the vulnerable feeling unwanted. And when this takes place, it leaves the abuse asking the same question that Tamar did in verse 13. Where could I ever go with my disgrace? Where can I go with my humiliation? 
Guys, in its most simplest definition, sexual abuse is any type of sexual behavior or contact where consent is not freely given or obtained. It's accomplished by force, intimidation, violence, coercion, manipulation, threat, deception, or abuse of authority. It's any form. It's any form is a display of power against the vulnerable. And here's the thing that I want us to understand because sometimes culture will try to communicate this. It is not a product of uncontrollable urges or acting out on impulses. It is primarily about violence and not about sex. And this is what we see happen in this story. It runs parallel with account after account after an account of so many women and children and men who have been sexually abused. And this is a bigger problem than what we either realize or care to talk about. In fact, according to the FBI, sexual assault is one of the most underreported crimes due primarily to fear and or embarrassment on the part of the victim. And so we don't even know a lot of the times it's going on, but how often is it happening? Well, according to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, they say this, one in five women in the U.S. experience completed or attempted rape during their lifetime. They say one in three female victims of completed or attempted rape experienced it for the first time between the ages of 11 and 17. About 25% of American men have experienced an attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. 81% of women and 43% of men reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment or assault in their lifetime. Approximately one in six women, that's 16.1% or an estimated 192 million women, and approximately 1 in 10 men, 9.6%, or an estimated 10.6 million men, experience sexual coercion. Essentially what they mean by that is being worn down by someone who repeatedly asks for sex, sexual pressure due to someone using their influence or authority at some point in their lifetime. Numbers don't lie. And when we don't want to listen to numbers, at the very least, we can listen to the countless stories that were made public during the Me Too movement that swept across the globe, shining a light on the courageous individuals who would open up about their unfortunate experiences in their life. Now, I know that this topic doesn't seem to fit into the whole of what we've been talking about in this series, when, it talks, when we've been talking about depression and anxiety and the like, but it has more to do with it than what we think. From the earliest studies, the most common psychological symptoms associated with sexual assault were anxiety and fear. Research consistently reports high levels of anxiety and fear immediately after the assault and for some even years later. Another study says, uh, have shown that the prominence of depression is found in the symptomology of sexual assault victims, particularly in the first three months after the incident and some considerably longer. You begin to immediately see this take place in Tamar's demeanor. And what's so heartbreaking about her depression, about where she was, her grief, her sadness, it wasn't brought on about any, uh, with anything that she's done, but what's been done to her. In Tamar's case, we see that she was abused and discarded, and to make matters worse, you see the response of her brother and her own father. Again, I don't know if you caught it, but let's read it again, verse 20. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has your brother Amnon been with you? Be quiet for now. Because he's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And so Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. And then when King David heard about all these things, he was furious. And then Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good nor bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. Absalom does the unthinkable here. But it happens often to those who come forward with this story of abuse. She was silenced. She was silenced. Did you catch it? He says, be quiet about it. Now we can interpret this as his meaning well to not bring shame upon her, but when victims of abuse are silenced, they are shamed into thinking that what just took place lacks importance. And add to that, her own father, King David, was furious, but he did nothing. The man who was strong enough to defeat Goliath did absolutely nothing to protect his little girl. When victims are abused and shamed, 
often the response or lack thereof of family and friends continue to pile on their shame. Those who should have been supportive and taken her side did not. They minimize what happened, showing that they did not understand the depth of her pain. And what we come to find out later on in this story is that Absalom, her older brother, would go on to murder Amnon, and it's this situation that would help the leading the kingdom of Israel to be divided. He would seek out vengeance. And you know, as I read that, there's a piece of me where I say, hey, guess what? Amnon got what he deserved. But as quickly as I find my heart going there, I'm reminded that there is a difference between revenge and justice. And this is what I mean by that. Revenge is rooted in emotion while justice lands on rationale. Revenge is personal. Justice is impartial. Revenge is an act of vindictiveness. Justice is vindication. Revenge is about cycles. Justice is about closure. Revenge focuses on retaliation. Justice is about restoring balance. And our hearts, oftentimes when we hear things like this, when we see these things happen, we want revenge. But can I share how I've unfortunately see this play out. I don't think that we, we typically don't hear or see revenge happening in uh, the case of Amnon and Absalom. We don't have a brother or a sibling or something go and murder the offender, right? What usually happens is, though, those who are abused here in our society, they find themselves trying to take back their sexuality. What I mean by that is they've convinced themselves that something that has been taken away from them, they can somehow now reclaim and allow themselves to become more sexually active with so many to show that their abuser that they did not win. And loved one, if that's you, when you operate in that way, you're not hurting them. You're only hurting yourself. Which leads us to ask this question again, the question that Tamar laid out for herself. That would become the cry of so many victims for years and years to come. Where can I go with my disgrace? Her question was left unanswered in this particular text. Absalom, her brother, responded to Tamar's pain by plotting to kill Amnon and silencing her. David, Tamar's father, ignored her disgrace. However, there was one who would later come and enter her pain and shame. Jesus would be killed not for revenge, but to bear her shame on the cross and to offer her a new robe of righteousness to replace her torn robes of disgrace. How Tamar felt after the assault described in verse 19 is shockingly similar to what Jesus experienced leading up and during his crucifixion for us. Jesus entered her pain and shame as Tamar's substitute to remove the stain of sins committed against her. And he rose from the dead to bring and restore healing and hope. And in the same way that he did that for her, loved one, if you are in this room, or if you're listening to this at another time, he did this for you too. He did it so that you can experience freedom from that unwanted shame brought on you. He did it so that you could experience life out of the ashes that were heaped on your head. He did it so that you'd make, he would make every bad thing untrue. When he said it's finished, he was not only talking about sin that you've done in your own personal life, but sin done against you physically and mentally as well. I need you to hear me say this. You are not to blame. You did not deserve that. You didn't ask for that. You should not be silenced. You are not worthless. You do not have to pretend that nothing happened. Nobody had the right to violate you. You are not responsible for what happened to you. You are not damaged goods. You were supposed to be treated with dignity and respect. You were the victim of assault and it was wrong. You were sinned against, and despite all of that pain, healing can happen, and there is hope. Where can you go? You can go to Jesus. Christian counselor Ed Welch, he says this, 
shame, which is brought about by the things that we've experienced, is the deep sense that you are inherently flawed, unacceptable, and unworthy of love because of something you've done, something done to you, or something associated with you. Shame says, I am defective, I am damaged, I am broken, I am flawed, I am dirty, I'm ugly, I'm impure, I'm disgusting, I'm unlovable, I'm weak, I'm pitiful, I'm insignificant, I'm worthless, I am unwanted. And all those things are not true. Literally right before I came up here, I usually sit up here and I worship. And the Holy Spirit brought Luke 8 to mind. And I want you to remember what takes place in Luke 8 because it's so beautiful here. There's a woman who had an issue of blood who her whole life felt unclean and unwanted. And she just knew that if she could reach to Jesus, that she would be healed. And in this big crowd of people, she reaches out and she touches the hem of his garment, the story says. And Jesus, on his way to perform a miracle, stops, right? He stops and he asks the question, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples, bro, we're in a crowd. There's a lot of people here. You probably got touched by a lot of people. And he says, no, no. This was a different touch. And he looks around and he sees this woman. And I I just think about the thoughts that are going in her mind. Her whole life, she was unwanted. Her whole life, she knew that she was, quote, unclean. And now all the attention, all the focus is on her again in this big old crowd. Could you imagine the emotions going on in her heart? And she has to say out loud, it it was me. And I love this part of the story. You just know that she didn't want to be humiliated and rejected again, but what happens might be the most profound moment in all of Scripture because it answers the most basic question of all religion. What is it like for us to be exposed And people know and see what's going on before a holy God. He looks at her. And he lifts up her head so that their eyes were locked. And he calls her daughter. He calls her daughter, which, by the way, in my quick five-minute research of this before coming here, is the only time that Jesus references anybody like that in Scripture. And he says to her, your faith has made you whole. We see in the story Jesus takes the initiative. He raises her head even before she can do it. And she's still looking at the ground in fear and shame. And he says, look to me, my precious daughter, look at me. I love that Psalm 3 calls God the lifter of our heads. You know what that communicates? That he does it because we can't. Because all the brokenness, all the hurt, it weighs heavy on us. I know it seems difficult to believe that in your hurts and in your brokenness and in your pains and in your trauma that you can still be loved and wanted, but it's true. And that truth has to be proclaimed over you in every area of your life that you don't want to be known in. I'm sorry for the wrong done towards you. And I'm sorry if you feel like the church has not been a place where you can find comfort. I can't promise perfection, but I can assure you that here at Proclamation Church, we want to walk with you in your trauma to the best of our abilities, whether you're ready to let us in. And if and when you are ready to let us in, I want you to know that that will be the most courageous thing that you could ever do. As unfortunate as this is, it's your story. And to let anyone else in on that story takes guts. And as your pastor, I want to applaud you. For any one of us, if one of these individuals in their courage decides to share this with you, this is what I need you to remember, and I'll say this in closing. Number one, you need to listen well. You need to listen well. Our response oftentimes is to want to give advice or to ask for more details. Listen, that's not your job. That's not your job. Scripture says for us to be slow to speak but quick to listen. We must remember that their vulnerability has already been exploited, and when we do anything else but listening at that moment, we're risking their vulnerability again. 
when you listen, listen well. So that when they are ready for you to speak, you're able to let them know that you heard them. And that they matter. Even when the lies they've been told to them say otherwise. So listen well. Number two, grieve. When the time comes for you to speak, or if they're inviting you to speak, your first word should be recognizing the evil that they've experienced. One of the best practices that we could do for people who are hurting is to simply hurt with them. To meet them where they are. If they are crying, you should be crying with them. If they're angry, you should be angry with them. Why? Because that's what our Lord would do. He's sad and he's angry at the sin done to them. If they're inviting you into speaking and you feel pressed to ask questions, these questions need to be broader so as to protect them from believing that your questions come from a place of disbelief in their circumstances. How are you doing? How can I help you? You don't need the details of their trauma. Again, you just need to know where to meet them. Which leads me to this in closing. Be an advocate. Be an advocate. What I mean by that is this. When walking with someone who is a victim of abuse, they should know that they have our support, whatever next steps are required. If they need to report it to the police, be there with them if they ask. Offer your time to be with them during that. But also understand in the midst of this, you're not a professional. That means you may need to connect them with an expert who can walk with them while at the same time you're supporting them and being there for them as needed. If this is a minor, you need to let them know that you can appreciate them telling you what took place and that you want to make sure that they're safe. So you're going to have to call people for help. Always, always, always when it comes to children, err on the side of asking for guidance because failure or delay to report for a child means that that child is still a target of abuse and not safe. Familiarize yourself with the laws and expectations of Tennessee. If you're listening online, you can find those laws uh, in your state. But if we want to learn what it means for us to be a church that cares well, there's a book that I would highly recommend. It's called this, Becoming a Church That Cares Well for the Abused. It was uh, edited by Brad Hambrick. It has several other uh, professional counselors and uh, uh, thought, people who have thought well in this area. Brad was a, is a counselor at the church where we came from. Highly recommend this book. So where do we go from here? There's a lot that we need to grow in in this area, and I believe there's action that we need to take. And we will take those as the problems come to our attention. But as always, I think the first thing that we need to do is pray. We're going to have time here where we're going to pray. And I want to ask our prayer team to come up. Specifically today, I asked uh, Deborah if she would find a few trusted individuals up here that we can pray that if there's anything that we could be praying for you about if you are one that have uh, you've been abused you know someone that has been if you're just trying to figure out her process a little bit more then we want to pray with you and if you feel uncomfortable praying up here could you point to them up here and say hey come and sit with me and pray they'll do that but we want to leave out of here in a posture of lament a couple weeks ago i shared how lament can be a good thing it's hard, but it could be a good thing because it's acknowledging the wrong that we see, the issues that's uh, uh, present, but it's asking and pleading and crying to God to meet us there. And so that's what I want us to do as we leave out of here. That maybe if you're not taking advantage of time to pray up here, that you leave out of here in the posture of prayer, that you know someone that's hurting, that maybe you yourself are hurting, you're asking God, meet me here. And guess what? He will. Scripture says that he is near to the brokenhearted. Psalm 13, you've been asking your question, how long, O Lord? How long am I going to have to carry this burden? How long am I going to have to deal with this? How long are these scars going to be present? I want to encourage you that you don't need to carry those things by yourself. Don't carry that burden alone. Let's be the church that cares for one another well loves one another well, walks with each other well in the midst of this. Father, 
this is difficult. You knew about brokenness. You knew about sin. You knew about this hurt. The foundations of the world. And in that, Father, that's why you sent Jesus to come. To not only live the life that we couldn't live, he died the death that we deserve to die. He did that to save us from sin. And he also did that to save from sin done to us. Father, there are many who are here today who are experiencing that, or who have experienced that. Would you be near to the broken heart today? We know that you could do it, so if we offer this up to you, believing that in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Family, why don't you stand to your feet? Again, we're up here to pray. Give us that opportunity to do that today, if you will. We love you. We'll see you next week. Go and proclaim.